Well, good morning to the congregation, especially those who may be visiting with us this morning, but also join with us through the ministry of the radio and also the internet. We gather together on this first day of the week, the Lord's Day. Uh, we come through a week of an earthly pilgrimage, and it is the experience of God's people that at times that earthly pilgrimage wears upon our soul. Uh, so we come hungry and we come thirsty, spiritually speaking, uh, into the assembly of God's people. But we come expecting to be refreshed as we experience the renewed mercies and the faithfulness of the Lord our God. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 63, uh, verses 1 through 5. O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with morrow and fatness. I shall praise you with joyful lips. Let us begin our service with a word of prayer. O oh God, we with great joy testify that you are our God, and so early in this Sabbath morning, we gather together as a congregation to seek you because our soul thirsts for you. Uh, we echo the psalmist expression that we live our life here in a dry and a thirsty land, and so we gather together with our spiritual brothers and sisters in your sanctuary, desiring to see your power and your glory. And would you then remind us that your loving kindness is better than life itself. And may that motivate us to praise you and to bless you. And may our soul then be satisfied as we praise you with joy and with thanksgiving. We offer up our prayer through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As you well know, it has pleased our Lord to gather unto himself in this past week, Maddie Bogarts. Uh, the last time I visited her a few weeks ago, uh, I simply asked her, Maddie, do you know who your Lord and Savior is? She testified without hesitation, oh yes, Jesus. Uh, we look through a glass dimly as the church militant. Uh, she has the opportunity this morning uh, to see our Lord and our Savior face to face as part of the church triumphant. And yet there is one church of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, those who live in faith, uh, looking unto Jesus Christ. And so to recognize that truth, uh, for our opening hymn this morning, uh, we'll turn in our Trinity Psalter hymnal to selection 473. Uh, we'll stand, if able, and sing all the stanzas of By the Sea of Crystal.
As a congregation, we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord our God who has made the heaven and the earth, and he greets us as his people this morning with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We turn then to the reading of the law of God. You can find that recorded in Exodus chapter 20. We read there as follows. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me, keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Uh, we'll respond to the hearing of the law of God with song, with a song of confession. We'll remain seated, but take our journal and turn to selection 51C, from which we'll sing stanzas 1, 2, 5, and 8. 1, 2, 5, and 8 of 51C.
Having confessed our sins, we then hear from our Lord as He assures people of God the full and the free pardon of their sins. Our text of pardon this morning comes from Psalm 103, verses 8 through 12. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. And so we as the people of God are assured of the pardon of our sins sins as we come to our Lord then morning congregational prayer uh, in addition to the numerous bulletin announcements we also want to remember uh, Mrs. Marilyn Hartman uh, she was hospitalized late last evening uh, so we'll lift her up in prayer uh, along with others listed in the bulletin let us then pray together our father in heaven our Lord and our God early in the morning we face on this beautiful Sabbath day uh, we come into the corporate assembly of the saints, but we come especially seeking your face uh, to offer unto you our praise and our thanksgiving, but also to have our hearts refreshed. And so we do confess in the presence of your majesty, but also of your mercy, our sin and our sinfulness. And we pray, Father, forgive us and also cleanse us and renew a right spirit within us as we begin this week as your people. Uh, we ask, Father, that by the influence of the Holy Spirit and by the guidance of your word, we might offer up the entirety of our being, all of our life, into your service, especially that we might glorify and praise your name as we go about our life in the midst of the community and in the relationships that we have. May we as a congregation be part of that light that shines forth in the midst of the darkness of a fallen world. Uh, and so, Father, we pray that you would keep us from temptation and grant us also deliverance from all of the tricks and strategies of the evil one. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would bless us uh, also as we meet together this morning by uh, the way of mutual encouragement and edification, especially for those members of this congregation who find that, spiritually speaking, uh, their knees have grown feeble and their hands hang down. Uh, those who are confronted by uh, death, also by the difficulties of life. Heavenly Father, we lift up especially those families uh, that are mourning the death of a loved one. We think of the Vanderwilt family, and we ask, Lord, that you would comfort them, and also the Hall family. Uh, Lord, bless them with spiritual comfort, uh, and also for the family of Maddie Bogard. Uh, Lord, we thank you that our Savior, Jesus Christ, knows what it is to stand outside of a tomb and to weep tears of sadness and grief over the death of a loved one. Uh, and may his sympathetic heart uh, also bless these mourning families uh, in the days and in the weeks that lie ahead. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would also remember uh, the individuals within this congregation who are in need of healing and strength. We pray especially this morning for Marilyn Hartman, and we ask that you would uh, grant her a stability and that you would give a recovery and renewed health. We pray, Father, for the medical community, uh, for the doctors, for the nurses, and for all of the various uh, support personnel. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you have given unto them. Uh, we ask that you would give them wisdom uh, in ministering to the physical needs of uh, Marilyn, but also all of those who find themselves hospitalized. We think too, Lord, of the various shut-ins, uh, those who, because of the infirmities of uh, age, especially as it may uh, impact their, their mind, those who are bound to a place of care, we ask that you would give them a Sabbath day blessing this morning, as perhaps they listen through uh, the radio, or maybe as they just quietly sit within their room. Uh, may the Spirit visit them in a special way, uh, granting them renewed spiritual strength. Uh, we ask, Lord, for your blessing upon uh, the office bearers of this congregation. Uh, as some men retire from office this morning, we thank you, Lord, for their faithful years of service. We ask that you would give them and their families a time of refreshment. We also lift up in prayer those men who will pick up the mantle of the office of elder and of deacon, 
Uh, Lord, would you bless them with wisdom, uh, with courage, with knowledge, with a spirit of faithfulness, with a humility and a meekness, but also with a firm conviction upon the authority of Scripture. And may they execute and fulfill the responsibilities of their office well, uh, leading this congregation in the way of life everlasting. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the providential provision for our physical lives, for daily food, uh, for shelter from the elements, uh, for a certain amount of peace and safety within uh, the civil realm. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would bless those who are called to office within uh, the civil magistrate and government. Uh, Lord, would you influence them by your spirit and by the principles of your word, uh, that these individuals might uh, continue to uphold of the law, uh, but also that they would then punish those who violate that law and reward those who follow that law so that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ might live a quiet and peaceable lives until our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ returns, for which we long and for which we await and for which we pray, Lord, come quickly. We ask all of this in his name. Amen. Our song of preparation, which we'll sing standing if able, is taken from the Trinity Psalter Hymnal, selection 404, uh, the four stanzas of the church's one foundation.
Within your Bible this morning, we would turn your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 3 in connection with the installation of office bearers. It is our desire to read this portion of Scripture uh, and to consider it together this morning. We read together then from 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of wives, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But in delayed I write, so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up, in glory. Thus far for this morning, our reading from the Word of God. A congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a biblical truth, but also one that is generally recognized that the leadership of any nation is of absolute importance to the well-being of that organization. We say that this is a general truth because this, by and large, is recognized even by the corporations of our world in commerce and in industry. If you were to talk to the executives of perhaps Apple, or perhaps General Motors, or perhaps if you were to interview Elon Musk, he would understand and they would articulate, yes, leadership is vital to the success of our organization. But we come from a different perspective and we recognize that this truth is a biblical truth. The leadership of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is of absolute importance. And now the leadership of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is of course underneath the headship of Jesus Christ as the king of the church, but that leadership is exercised through the various offices, including that of the minister of the word and sacrament, but also that of the elders and of deacons. And so in connection this morning with the installation of elders and deacons, we consider the leadership of the church and its vital importance. Uh, The leadership of the church gives guidance to the church, sets the direction of the church. The leadership of the church uh, determines the spiritual course of the congregation. And and by and large, we would say that that the, the leadership, the elders and the deacons of a local particular congregation determine the barometer, the spirituality of that particular congregation. The spiritual maturity of a congregation, by and large, will never rise higher than the spiritual maturity of the office bearers. But it will come close to that maturity of the office bearers. And so you could do a historical survey, and you can take a particular congregation, and and some continue on in the, the course of faithfulness, fidelity to the biblical Reformed faith. Others gradually or perhaps more rapidly depart from that biblical faith. 
uh, down the road of apostasy. Well, what determines the difference? Well, we understand, of course, that the sovereignty of God determines the difference. But the sovereignty of God works itself out through the leadership of the congregation. And so you can look at a congregation that has, by God's grace, stood faithful over decades, perhaps over 100 years. And that faithfulness, by and large, is attributed to God's goodness in providing faithful men in the office of elder and deacon. And so given the importance uh, of faithful office bearers, we want to consider this morning uh, 1 Timothy 3, underneath this broad theme, instruction concerning office bearers. We'll notice, first of all, the position of office bearers, then secondly, the character of of office bearers, and then thirdly, the motivation for office bearers. So biblical instruction concerning office bearers, the position, the character, and the motivation for office bearers. Uh, By way of beginning, what exactly is an office bearer? We would say that an office bearer is this, a man who has been called by God through the internal call verified or confirmed by an external call from a local particular congregation who is then put into a place of authority by God himself through the means of the local council and the local congregation and being placed in that position of authority is given a responsibility to serve in a specific role. Uh, And we have before us this morning, uh, leaving for our purposes uh, to the side, the office of the minister of the word and of sacrament, we have the position of a bishop and the position of a deacon. Uh, What then is the position of a bishop uh, or that of an elder? And, And those terms are distinct terms used within Scripture, and yet we'll treat them as synonymous terms as they apply to one and the same office and one and the same position. Uh, The word bishop or elder is indicating a person who is placed in an appointed overseeing capacity. So when we think of an elder in a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, the word elder has this idea that the man is mature in his age, and hopefully along with that maturity in his age, there is also a maturity in his spiritual understanding. Uh, But he is called an elder, or he is called a bishop, because Jesus Christ has appointed that man, along with the plurality of elders, especially to oversee, to watch over the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in that particular congregation, to watch over especially the doctrine and the life of that congregation. And we derive this description of the work of an office bearer, of an elder or of a bishop, from Acts 20, verse 28. And there the Apostle Paul gives his final charge uh, to a group of elders, and he says... Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. I just want to pause there and point out that the elders, the body of elders, first of all, are to take heed, that is, look very carefully after themselves. There is a certain structure that is important for us to recognize. Paul says, take heed, look carefully, watch diligently, over yourselves. And then having done that and doing that, then take heed to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And so the elders, which we then term as the consistory, they are to shepherd one another. And they are to shepherd the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Leading themselves and the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ in what we might call the green pastures of the Word of God. And when you think of what a shepherd did back in the day and what a shepherd perhaps still does, uh, there's a variety of tasks involved in faithful shepherding. Uh, There is a protective task. Uh, There is a leading task, a guiding task, a nurturing task. Uh, There is the task also uh, of applying medicinal remedies to sheep who may be injured 
or who may be ill. Uh, and Scripture all throughout uses uh, that analogy to indicate something of the task of an elder. And so to those men whom God has called to be elders here in this congregation, your task is to oversee yourself, but also your fellow elders in spiritual maturity and in spiritual growth. And then collectively, as a body of elders, to protect this congregation, especially from the wolves of false doctrine uh, and from false teaching, but also to walk among the flock here and, and to have a careful eye. And, and many in this congregation uh, are involved in animal husbandry uh, and a good cattleman, we might say, and I understand that there's a difference between sheep and cattle, but a good cattleman, he has an eye, and he can pick up uh, if one of the herd is lagging behind. He can pick up just by observation uh, if perhaps the ears of a, uh, of a calf are down. It indicates something. And elders within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ must have that same attention to spiritual detail. Noticing there is a member who's lagging behind the flock. There's a member who seems to be limping along. There's a member who perhaps is beginning uh, to stray from the rest of the flock. And then the elder and the elders are to pursue and to protect, and to draw that member back into the fold of the kingdom of God. Elders, this is your work. And congregation, let us recognize that this is their work. But there's not only the office or the position of elder, there's also the position uh, of a deacon. The word deacon indicates an official position of an appointed servant of mercy and compassion. I trust but I also certainly hope that we never have the idea that the deaconry are just simply the CFOs of this organization, the chief financial officers. I hope and I pray that we never have the idea that they are just the money men who make sure that in the accounting world that all of the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. The deaconry, the office of deacon, is to be a visible manifestation of the mercy and the compassion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And what a glorious wonder it is that the head of the church is characterized by meekness, by mercy, and by compassion. And in this fallen world in which there is the experience of death and of difficulty, of disappointments, it is especially the deacons who are to visibly and in tangible ways display within the congregation primarily, but also outside of the congregation as opportunity may permit itself. They are to be the hands, so to speak, of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, expressing to those especially in dire need the compassion of Jesus Christ. And, and now if this is what the deaconry is to do as that office is instituted in Acts 6, verse 1 and 2. You perhaps remember that there was a dispute that arose in the early church because some widows were neglected. And so the apostles deemed it not wise that their uh, attention should be distracted from uh, the ministry of the Word. And so they appointed men, faithful men, men filled with the Holy Spirit, men of godly character. And they said, you see to the daily administration of the expression of mercy by providing for those uh, in uh, a situation of need. A and flowing out of that, what a remarkable testimony that the deacons have. The deacons in their very demeanor, in, the, in their very constitution, and in their words and in their actions uh, ought to be a living and breathing expression that the head of the church is characterized by compassion by mercy. And so the deacons ought to show forth this mercy and this compassion, especially to those who find themselves in times of need. Uh, and to the deacons of this congregation, you need to have the mentality that you are the embodied display of the compassion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
And this especially is to radiate from you uh, as you go about your work and as you meet and as you visit those who find themselves in distressing circumstances. You come, yes, with tangible expressions of mercy, but also with words of mercy, with biblical text of mercy, with prayers of mercy and of compassion. And as a congregation, uh, when we see the deacons go about their work, although much of their work is done in an appropriate confidentiality, when we see the deacons go about their work, it ought to be a continual reminder that our Lord Jesus Christ is not harsh. He's not harsh. But towards His people, He is characterized with loving kindness, with mercy, and with compassion. And so it is vitally important that when we consider the position of office bearers, of elder and of deacon, that we do not follow our own imagination, but that we are bound to what the Word of God has to say uh, about these positions. And that includes also then what we consider in our second point, the character of office bearers. The character of office bearers, and here again, we do not simply sit around in a circle and make our own list of what we think would be good attributes for an office bearer. We do not need to do that, nor should we do that, because our Lord Jesus Christ and the inspired Scriptures has given us a list uh, of the qualifications of the character of an office bearer. Before we begin to look at that character in more detail, we just simply want to state that this godly character is not a result of just simple humanistic moral reform. It's not as if these men have set themselves apart by their own actions, but rather as a result of the influence of the grace of the redeeming grace of our Lord, as a result of the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit, as a result of the sanctifying process, as redemption is applied in reality to the mind and to the heart of a a man, there, there comes this display of the characteristic of not perfection, but of godliness. This character, first of all, can be described positively. And here we we begin to look more closely at 1 Timothy 3, but, but not in a tight, exegetical manner, not taking phrase by phrase, but rather looking somewhat more broadly. And you'll notice that the godly character of office bearers is to display itself in the domestic realm, in the home. It has been said by someone, and I fully agree with it, a man is what a man is in the home, in in that relationship, in the relationship of God has brought it about, in the relationship of marriage, and in the relationship of parenting. So an office bearer's character must be displayed first and foremost towards his wife and towards his children, if he has them. We understand uh, that a man may be a single man in office. Paul himself was such a man. Uh, But if a man is married, his godly character must be evident first and foremost to his wife. And if a man in office has children, The man's godly character must be evidence to his children. So all of these terms that are used, a man must be blameless, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, gentle, reverent. And again, this is not a standard of absolute perfection. Every single faithful office bearer will testify to the reality of their own sin and of their own sinfulness. Nevertheless, there must be the display of a maturity along these lines. And this will show in his interaction in the domestic realm, in the home. You can think of the relationship with his wife. Now, when Paul writes these instructions to Timothy, the Roman culture, and I know sometimes we think that the world is getting worse in an unprecedented pace, Uh, but don't pretend that everything was fine and well uh, in the days of the early church. The Roman culture was incredibly perverse, incredibly immoral, and that immorality and perversity also impacted the relationships that men had with their wives. And in contrast to that gross immorality, 
the leader of the church, whether it was in Paul's day or whether it be in our day of gross sexual immorality, a leader in the church must be exemplary as he expresses faithfulness toward his one and only wife. Literally, when it says that an office bearer must be the husband of one wife, it means he must be a one-woman man. And there must be no doubt about it that his affections are set completely and wholly upon the wife of his youth. And without going into too much detail, there is a desperate need for the church to manifest this type of devotion among the office bearers. Because the church has a message from the Word of God concerning faithfulness and concerning sexual morality. But I guarantee you that if our actions contradict our message, the world laughs and mocks and ridicules the church which is the house of God. And so, office bearers, let it be plainly evident that you are the husband of one wife, that you are a one-woman man. Let the entire congregation know that. And by extension, let the entire community know that by the grace of God, the leadership at Covenant Reformed Church is characterized by men who are one women men. Also in relationship to children. If a man does not know how to rule his own house well, how can he then begin to rule the house of God? Now this, of course, also does not mean that the households of office bearers are perfect. But there is to be a general characterization uh, that the home life is in order. Uh, that the children uh, are those who follow the faithful instructions of their parents. That there's not a spirit of rebellion that lives in the home. That there's not a constant friction uh, and a brokenness uh, of relationships. And, and there is a danger for the office bearers to pay so much attention to the work of being an office bearer that there is then a neglect upon the home life. If the home is not well ordered, an office bearer cannot faithfully fulfill his duties as an elder and as a deacon. So to the elders and the deacons, take care of your homes. By the grace of God, of course. With fervent prayer, of course. But make sure that the home is in order. And a word to the wives of office bearers, because our text includes a word to the wives of office bearers. In verse 11, likewise, their wives, that is the wives of office bearers, especially deacons, but also by extension uh, to elders, they must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. In this way, the wife of an office bearer assists her husband in fulfilling that great calling that great calling from God that this man is set apart to serve in the office of elder and deacon. Uh, and the wife can do much to assist him in executing uh, the office of elder and deacon if she will, by the grace of God, be reverent, not a slanderer, temperate and faithful in all things. Now there's also a negative description. And the Scriptures often do this. They describe something from a positive, but then also a negative. And so the first negative that we would draw your attention to concerning the character of an office bearer is that he should not be a novice. We might say he should not be a rookie. He should not be someone who is new to the faith, someone who is immature in the Christian faith. You'll notice that this is stated both in reference to elders and to deacons in verse 6 and verse 10. They ought not to be someone who is new to the faith. We might say, well, why? Because there is an inherent danger of pride. There is an inherent danger of pride among a novice. And when I reflect back upon my seminary years, I believe that this also 
infects many seminarians, myself included. I think I knew more, I have to say that correctly, I think that I thought I knew more back in seminary than I do today. Seminarians are sometimes characterized by this overconfidence. They think that they know everything. And then as the years of actual pastoral ministry begin to unfold, they realize that they don't know everything. And the same is true, I believe, in many professions. Uh, you, you could take perhaps uh, someone in a vocational trade and, and they, they spend a summer doing a vocational trade and, and they think that they have pretty much mastered the trade. But then as the years unfold, they realize, well, there's a whole lot more to know about this. The same is true also uh, in schooling. I can remember uh, a certain one of uh, me and my wife's children at second grade, they thought they had mathematics pretty much mastered. They knew everything they was to know about math. But then as you go on and you study more and more about math, you realize, boy, the mathematical equations become much more difficult. It's been said that Albert Einstein once said to a struggling student, do not worry about your mathematical problems. I assure you that mine are much greater. The more you really know about something, at times the more you realize how little you know about something. I say all this because there is an inherent danger of pride for the minister, for the elder, and for the deacon. And Scripture is clear that it is this danger of pride that led to the fall of Satan and of that angelic rebellion. And here again, without being overly descriptive, but you can survey the history of the church, and you can see instances when men were characterized by pride. And the proverbial truth is certainly true, that a haughty spirit leads to a fall. Or as we often paraphrase it, pride comes before the fall. Men who are being in office, and men who are in office, be forewarned about pride. It's the most deadly sin, especially within an office bearer. So let not a man be a novice, nor let him be an uncontrolled man. An uncontrolled man is a disaster waiting to happen, especially within the consistory room or the council room. An uncontrolled man who is uncontrolled in his own activities, whether that be in relationship to strong drink or whether that be in relationship to uh, the words that come forth from his mouth. Emotional outbursts. And we understand the passion for the faith and the passion for the faith that at times expresses itself uh, in a consistory meeting or in a council meeting or at a meeting of classes or synod. But there is also a danger, and the danger is linked with pride, and the danger can be this, that an office bearer can be a man characterized by pride who then in his pride excuses his emotional outbursts. And he says, well, I'm just being passionate about the faith when in all reality is tearing his brothers apart. Let a man who is going to be a faithful office bearer be a man who can control himself, who can control his emotions, who can control his passions, who, who can control that what he says, both when he says it and how he says it, as well as what he says. This also applies, of course, to greed uh, and to points of contention. The office bearer must be a man who is able, by the grace of God, to control himself. And so something of the character of the office bearer the office bearer must be a man who by God's grace is faithful in his relationships within the home and then also within public life as he will be characterized within the community. Again, not with moral perfection, but with a blamelessness, with a certain temperateness, sober-mindedness. So the community ought to testify that these men are indeed men who are of good behavior. You know, persons do develop reputations. And perhaps those reputations are not, not always faithful, but usually they are generally accurate. And you can go around and you can 
not in a slanderous nor gossiping way, but you can ask about a person. And especially in a community uh, as small, we don't say that in any sense of a derogatory uh, means, but as small and as close-knit as Pala. You can ask, well, what about that Greg Lovers? Well, maybe it's a little bit premature for that, but in 10 years you'll be able to say, what about that Greg Lovers? And people will tell you, well, he's this type of man, or he's that type of man. And what they say often reveals the character of a man. And the office bearers of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be men whom when you ask, what about him? The community says he is a temperate, gentle, faithful, godly man who is fervently committed to his one wife and who rules his children well. Well, briefly, our third point, the motivation for office bearers, why should they give themselves to this work? For those who have been in office, also for the families of those who have been in office, you know that this is a sacrificial work. Many hours, many meetings, uh, many times of agonizing over what is the right decision and how to address this problem. Why would a man engage in this work? Verse 1 gives us a clue and indicator of why. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. The work of an elder, and by extension the work of a deacon, is a good work. It is something that is profitable. It is something that is noble. And, and the goodness, if we may say it that way, of this work, the nobility of the work that is done by an elder or also by a deacon is found in the fact that it is a work that is done for the people of God, but even more importantly, for God Himself. And this mindset must encompass a man in office. You must know that when you go about the duties of your respective office, you do not do it just for yourself. That you do it unto the Lord. The Apostle Paul begins to conclude his epistle to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians by stressing uh, that they are to continue in the faithful work knowing that it is done unto the Lord. This is why the office of elder and why the office of deacon uh, is a good work. Uh, this is also what the Apostle Paul stated in Acts 20, verse 28. Shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. When we think of the church, that is, when, when we function with our ecclesiology, when we view the church, whether with our actual senses of sight or whether in our minds, and when an elder is sitting in a consistory meeting or, or making a call or going on a visit or, or analyzing some situation, and, and when a deacon, along with a fellow deacon, comes on a benevolent visit or, or, or visits the, the widows of the congregation or, or those who find themselves in other types of situations of need, they must do so recognizing this is the church which God has purchased with His own blood. Now what do you think about when you think about the church? When you think about that member seated in front of you and seated behind you and seated next to you. When an office bearer goes and visits somebody in the memory care unit at the cottages. This is the church which God has purchased with His own blood. That's why this is a good work. Whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto Christ. And may that truth motivate all of the office bearers to a spirit of faithfulness. Because the church is the house of God. Verse 15 uh, of 1 Timothy 3, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. I don't know if it's so common in our day, but I remember when I was growing up, uh, we would be going somewhere to visit someone. And my mother and my father 
at times would say to myself and my brother and my sister, you know how to act. Today, sometimes you wonder if that statement has any truth to it. Do the children know how to act? But they would just look at us and say, you know how to act. And we did know how to act. Now, we didn't always act how we knew how to act, and then there were other ramifications. What Paul is saying to Timothy, and by extension uh, to the churches that Timothy labored in, you know how to act in the church of God, because I've just spelled it out for you in these pastoral epistles. This is the house of God. Not the carpet. Not the wood. Not the shingles. But the living members within this congregation. And we must recognize that we are the house of God because it is here that God delights to dwell, to tabernacle, to fellowship, to live among His people through the redeeming work of His Son, Jesus Christ. And this house of God is to be, because it is, the pillar and the ground of truth. The pillar... Uh, in the sense of holding up the truth of the Word of God in our communities. And so the motivation for a faithful exercise of a term of elder or of deacon is that this house of God might faithfully bear the truth of the Word of God into the hearts and into the lives of men, women, and children. And so in closing, to those who are office bearers in this church, and I say it to myself as well, conduct yourselves like men. Like men of God. Like men of God who have been called by God. And congregation, you'll hear this also uh, in the form, receive these men with all of their imperfections, but receive them as men called by God. And as a church, Let us hold the truth of the Word of God up highly that it might blaze forth clearly in our oftentimes darkened communities. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for giving us a revelation concerning how we ought to conduct ourselves in the house of God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask now that You would also bless these words with the powerful application of the Holy Spirit especially in the hearts and the lives of the office bearers, but in all of the members of this congregation, so that your name might never be blasphemed on our account, but might always be honored and glorified. These things we humbly pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Then for the installation of office bearers, if you'll take your forms and prayers book out of the pew rack on page 80, uh, we have a form which we use that only, not only reminds us uh, about the offices of elder and of deacon, uh, but also presents questions uh, to the brothers who will be installed as elders and deacons by which they, in the presence of God and the congregation, can affirm that they have a faithful understanding of these offices and also that they promise to faithfully execute the duties of these offices. So we begin reading uh, on page 80. Congregation of Jesus Christ, the council has made known to you the names of our brothers here present who were chosen to the offices of elder and deacon in this church. They have indicated their belief in our confessions by their agreement with the form of subscription, which they'll do in just a moment. Since there were no lawful objections, we shall proceed to their ordination in the name of the Lord. Let us listen to what the Word of God teaches regarding these offices. The office of elder is based on the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, who when he ascended left his church in the world and provided it with officers who should rule in his name. The Apostle Paul in Acts insist upon the ordination of elders in every church and in his first letter to Timothy commands that those who rule well should be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. In this and other passages, Paul distinguishes between the elders who labor, particularly in the ministry of the Word and the sacraments, and those who are responsible for the supervision of the church, together with the ministers of the Word. Therefore, the church from the beginning has had elders in addition to ministers. The work of the elders is that of ruling in the name of the ascended king, 
and as servants of the great shepherd caring for his flock. It is also the duty of the elders to maintain the purity of the word and sacraments and to uphold the good order of the church, carefully guarding the sanctity of the offices and faithfully exercising discipline. They should, with love and humility, promote the faithful discharge of the office by their fellow officers, having particular regard to the doctrine and conduct of the minister of the word, that the church may be edified and may show itself to be the pillar and ground of the truth. To fill such a sacred office honorably, the elders should set an example of godliness in their personal life, in their home life, and in their relations with their fellow men. Walking thus in all godliness and faithfully discharging their office, when the chief shepherd appears, they will receive the unfading crown of glory. The office of deacon is based upon the love and concern of Christ for his own. This concern is so great that he considers what is done to one of the least of his brothers as done to him. In this way, our Lord identifies the needy as his representatives in our expression of sympathy and benevolent service on earth. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. According to Acts 6, the apostles themselves in the beginning ministered to the needy, but afterward, being overburdened with this service to the extent that some were neglected, certain men were chosen, to whom they committed the special responsibility of exercising this ministry, leaving the apostles greater opportunity to continue steadfastly in prayer and in the ministry of the word. Since that time, the church has recognized this service as a distinct office. The work of the deacons consists in the faithful and diligent gathering of the offerings which God's people in gratitude make to their Lord, in the prevention of poverty, in the humble and cheerful distribution of gifts according to the need, and in the relief of the distressed, both with kind deeds and with words of comfort and encouragement from Scripture. To fill such a sacred office worthily, the deacons as well as the elders should set an example of godliness in their personal life, in their home life, and in their relations with their fellow men, thus conducting themselves as worthy representatives of Christ's loving care and faithfully ministering in His name to those who are the beloved of God, they gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And then at this time, we would ask the brothers who will be installed as elders and deacons to stand here in the presence of the congregation and also in the presence of God himself. Brothers, in order that the church may hear that you are willing to take your respective offices upon you, please answer the following questions. First, do you elders and deacons feel in your hearts that you are lawfully called by God's church and therefore by God himself to your respective holy offices? Second, you believe the Old and New Testaments to be the only word of God and the doctrinal standards of this church to be in harmony with them. Third, having heard the description of the purpose and requirements of these offices, do you promise to fulfill them faithfully by the grace of God? You elders in the government of the church, together with the ministers of the word, and you deacons in the ministration to the poor. Fourth, do you promise to walk in all godliness and submit to the government of the church in all things pertaining to your office? What then is your answer, Joel Brafhart? What is your answer, Bruce DeBrine? What is your answer, Calvin Fopma? What is your answer, Calvin Minders? What is your answer, Jim Minders? What is your answer, Brian Van Arendonk? What is your answer, Chris Vermeer? What is your answer, Ryan Zylstra? May the Almighty God and Father fill you all with His grace that you may faithfully and fruitfully discharge your respective offices. Amen. You may be seated. I charge you, elders, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be diligent in the government of the church, which is committed to you jointly with the minister of the word. Be faithful watchmen over the house of God, taking heed 
that purity of doctrine and godliness of life be maintained. I charge you, deacons, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be diligent in receiving the gifts of God's people, wise and cheerful in the distribution of the same, and sympathetic and self-denying in the ministry of Christian mercy. And I charge you, beloved Christians, to receive these brothers as the servants of God, sustaining them with your daily prayers. Render to the elders all honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord. Provide the deacons generously with the necessary gifts for the needy, remembering that insomuch as you do it to the least of these his children, you do it to him. May God give us to see in the ministry of the elders the supremacy of Christ, and in the ministry of the deacons the care and love of the Savior. Being thus engaged in your respective callings, each one of you shall receive of the Lord the reward of righteousness. Let us then pray. O Lord God and Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have been pleased for the better edification of your church to ordain in it rulers and assistants besides the ministers of the word, by whom your church may be preserved in peace and prosperity and the needy assisted. We thank you for giving us in this place men who are of good testimony and by your promise endowed with your spirit. We ask you to provide them more and more with such gifts as are necessary for them in their service, with the gifts of wisdom, courage, discretion, benevolence, sympathy, and self-denial, to the end that each one may acquit himself as is becoming in his respective office. May the elders take great care of doctrine and life in keeping out the wolves from the sheepfold of your beloved Son and in admonishing and reproving disorderly persons. Likewise, the deacons in carefully receiving gifts and generously and wisely distributing them to the poor and in comforting them with your holy word. Give grace both to elders and deacons that they may persevere in their faithful labor and never become weary by reason of any trouble, pain, or persecution of the world. Grant especially your divine grace to this people over whom they are placed that they may willingly submit themselves to the good exhortations of the elders, counting them worthy of honor for their work's sake. Give to the rich, generous hearts toward the needy, and to the needy, grateful hearts toward those who help and serve them. To the end that everyone acquitting himself of his duty, your holy name may thereby be magnified, and the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, enlarged, in whose name we conclude our prayers. Amen. Oh, we'll then turn to our song of dedication from the Trinity Psalter Hymnal, selection 544. We'll stand, if able, and sing the three stanzas of 544.
My apologies in that I omitted having the newly installed office bearers come forward and to sign the form of subscription. Uh, we have the reading of that. First of all, it's on the back of the bulletin. And we state that the undersigned ministers of the gospel, elders and deacons of the United Reformed Congregation of Covenant Reformed Church of Pella of Classes Central U.S. do hereby sincerely and in good conscience before the Lord declare by this our subscription that we heartily believe and are persuaded that all the articles and points of doctrine contained in the Belgic Confession and Heidelberg Catechism of the Reformed Churches, together with the explanation of some points of the aforesaid doctrine made by the National Synod of Dortrecht, 1618-19, do fully agree with the Word of God. We promise, therefore, diligently to teach and faithfully to defend the aforesaid doctrine, without either directly or indirectly contradicting the same by our public preaching, teaching, or writing. We declare, moreover, that we not only reject all errors that militate against this doctrine, and particularly those which were condemned by the above-mentioned synod, but that we are disposed to refute and contradict these and to exert ourselves in keeping the church free from such errors. And if hereafter any difficulties or different sentiments respecting the aforesaid doctrine should arise in our minds, we promise that we will neither publicly nor privately propose or defend the same, either by preaching, teaching, or writing, until we have first revealed such sentiments to the consistory, classis, or synod, that the same may there be examined, being ready always cheerfully to submit to the judgment of the consistory, classis, or synod, under the penalty in case of refusal, of being by that very fact suspended from our office. And further, if at any time the consistory, classis, or synod, upon sufficient grounds of suspicion, and to preserve the uniformity and purity of doctrine, may deem it proper to require of us a further explanation of our sentiments respecting any particular article of the Confession of Faith, the Catechism, or the explanation of the National Synod, we do hereby promise to be always willing and ready to comply with such requisition under the penalty above mentioned, reserving for ourselves, however, the right of appeal in case we should believe ourselves agreed by the sentence of the consistory or the classis. And until a decision is made upon such an appeal, we will acquiesce in the determination and judgment already passed. And so at this time, I would request the newly installed brothers to come forward and to sign the form of subscription after which they may be seated. At this time, the deacons will receive our morning tithes and offerings, which will be given for the Christian Education Assistance Fund. After that, our doxology, which will sing Standing If Able, will be O Praise Ye the Lord, Selection 149B of our Trinity Psalter Hymnal, and we'll sing stanzas 1, 3, and 4.
Now, people of God, receive the blessing of your Lord and go together in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God with the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.